Okay, good morning. Welcome to BC213, the course on the end times. And uh, thank you to each of you for connecting to the class. May I request somebody to please uh, pray with the class and we will get started. Anybody could unmute your mic and uh, please pray. Pastor, can I pray? Please go ahead, Sri Kumar. Thank you. Precious Father, we thank you, praise you, honor you for this wonderful morning which you have given to us, O God. We submit everything into your mighty hand. We ask you, Father God, fill us with your wisdom, knowledge, and revelation, O Father God. Enlighten our understanding, O God, with your word, with the power of your word, O Father God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that Father, let your presence lead us and guide us today, Father God, in everything what we do, in everything what we do, Father God. Lord Master, let your Holy Spirit lead us, O oh Father God. Lord Master, I pray, Father God, especially for your servant of God. Lord Master, let the Holy Spirit speak through him, O oh Lord Master, and every revelation, every word of wisdom, every word of knowledge which is going to come out, O oh Father God. Let it be enveloped with your glory. Let it be enveloped with your grace. Let it be enveloped with your Lord Master, with your with your with your power, power, O oh Father God. Lord, we prepare our heart to receive your word, O oh God, Master. Strengthen us so that we can grow and we can flourish for your kingdom, O oh God. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, once again. Um, we are uh, in this course on the end times, and uh, we have been... Uh, uh, doing an overview of the chronology or the sequence of events uh, that will play out um, in the end times. Um, we have, uh, so we're doing a panoramic view, so we're just a high level view of things. And uh, we are using uh, or just journeying through the book of Revelation. And uh, our premise is that the Book of Revelation has been given to us in a sequence, um, in a chronology of events. Um, and so we are just following that and saying this is how it has been given and this is how uh, we expect the things to expect things to unfold. Uh, and uh, so we've been looking at that. We uh, have uh, journeyed through uh, all the way till the end of chapter 12, which we did last week. Uh, we went through the seven seals um, that were opened, starting with Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And each seal uh, is indicating some sort of judgment that's happening on the earth, affecting the people on the earth. Revelation chapter 7, uh, we see the 144,000 Jews been marked by God. And um, as we will discover later, these uh, people are uh, serving the Lord Jesus Christ in some way during those uh, during the seven-year tribulation. Uh, we are also seeing in uh, you know Revelation seven that there are a lot of Revelation six and also in Revelation seven that there are a lot of people who are martyred or killed during the tribulation. Uh, for their faith in Christ, and we see them appearing before the throne of God. And uh, so we've gone through um, the seven seals. Then when we come into Revelation 8, uh, we have the seven trumpets. And once again, each trumpet is indicating some catastrophic happening here on earth um, that is affecting the lives of people everywhere. And um, uh, Revelation uh, 10 is uh, kind of a, 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 a intermission where uh, an angel appears to John and tells him to eat a book, uh, basically tell, signifying that there's a lot more that he's going to prophesy uh, about the nations and about all of that. Revelation 11, we said, is the middle of the seven-year period. Uh, the reason is because in Revelation 11, he clearly mentions 
uh, Revelation 11 verse 2, he clearly mentions 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. Then again, in Revelation 11 and verse 3, he mentions 1,260 days. Again, that uh, uh, comes up to the three and a half year period approximately. So we are saying that Revelation 11 is the midpoint. And then uh, what we see in Revelation 11 is that there are two witnesses who appear. So, you know, we had a little discussion uh, last week. Who could these two witnesses be? You know, what, what would be our, uh, our understanding or maybe I should say even a guess, a good guess uh, based on, you know, the information we have in the scriptures. Who could this be? How would they possibly come into the world around the middle of the tribulation? But um, so that that is you know still open for discussion. Uh, we can we can make our best guess, our best judgment based on the information we have. But what is clearly given to us in Revelation 11 is that these two witnesses are going to be on the earth during the second half of the tribulation, and they are going to be you know bearing witness to the Lord with mighty power, signs, wonders, miracles, and then towards the end of that seven year period end of the tribulation which is the end of the second half of the tribulation they would be killed their bodies would be lying in the streets of jerusalem and everybody going to see it and um, and we said that we are actually living in a time when that is possible you know uh, when the whole world can see what is happening we are living in such a time where revelation 11 uh, what is said about these people can actually be fulfilled you know, so we are saying that's one indicator of how close we are to the end of times. Then uh, in Revelation 11, uh, second part, there's the sound of the seventh angel, which is a proclamation saying, look, the time has come. The kingdoms of the earth are going to be taken up by the kingdom of God. So it's we are, we are very close. Revelation 12, which we uh, went through uh, last week, um, uh, it's again uh, talking about the middle of the tribulation because there again in Revelation 12 we have the mention of 1260 days that is in Revelation 12 verse 6 then uh, again he mentions in um, Revelation 12 14 uh, a time times and half a time which is three and a half years and um, yeah so uh, both these are indicative that Revelation 12 happens in the middle of the tribulation, middle on to the end, the second half of the tribulation, 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days. Right? Basically, the summary of Revelation 12 is Satan and his demons make a final attempt to go into the place, the heavens, to the place where God is. Sorry, no entry. You cannot come here. They cast out or sent out and Satan comes back to the earth knowing his time is short. And he goes with full vengeance against the woman, that is the nation of Israel, because she gave birth to the male child, that is Jesus Christ, who had come. So he's going out full vengeance, and but God preserves the nation of Israel, protects them, the people, during that three and a half year period. And uh, Satan is all out against them. In what way would he be all out against the nation of Israel? Obviously, he's going to instigate people to come against the nation of Israel. And we will see that a little later in um, uh, chapter 15 and so on. Uh, that, that actually is played out for us. Okay, So we've reached uh, the end of Revelation 12. We are continuing now from Revelation 13. So what else is happening during this tribulation? In Revelation 13, uh, very interestingly, John is getting images that are very similar to Daniel's prophecy. So book, in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel also saw visions. And uh, he, you know, in one of his visions in Daniel 7, um, he sees beasts, animals. So he, you know, he sees uh, 
a, a leopard, a bear, a lion, and then a fourth beast as well. And that same picture is used, is given to John. So you can imagine John, when he's seeing all this, in his mind, he says, hey, this is exactly what Daniel saw. And each of these beasts are representing different world empires, as was explained to Daniel in Daniel chapter 7. The leopard represents the Greek empire. The bear represents the Medo-Persian empire. The lion represents the Babylonian empire. The beast that came on later was representing the, um, the, the Roman Empire. So, uh, you know, now, now John sees this, and then from the, uh, he actually sees a beast who is a composite of all of this, meaning, uh, so basically, and we will study this next year, basically from this region, that comprised of the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and subsequently the Roman Empire, which was the largest in its extent, uh, would emerge the Antichrist. And so if you look geographically at the extent of the Roman Empire, of course it covered all of Europe and extended into across the Mediterranean into uh, parts of modern day Turkey across the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, and on. So that was the extent of the Roman Empire. And uh, Daniel has additional information, which of course uh, is not spoken to John, but you know, we will see that uh, um, in Daniel's visions, it's, it's very clear that from one of the portions of the Greek empire. So Alexander the Great, you read about him in Revelation 8. Um, uh, he was a leader, the first leader of the Greek empire and he, had, he grew and expanded very powerfully. When he was overthrown and was killed, his empire was divided into four parts, uh, which basically covers the region around Greece, uh, around Turkey, uh, all around Syria, and. And, and all around Egypt. And uh, what was revealed to Daniel is from one of these four regions would emerge the Antichrist. So that's what John sees in Revelation 13. He sees the beast, which is the Antichrist. And the beast is empowered by the dragon, which we read about in Revelation 12, that is Satan himself. He empowers the beast, Revelation 13 verse two. The dragon gives him authority and throne. So this beast, this antichrist, is empowered by Satan himself. And, um, you know, it seems like in verse 3 of Revelation 13, there must have been an assassination attempt against the antichrist because it says here that he was mortally wounded, but he survived. And that really gets people to, you know, um, uh, what to say, to follow this man. And uh, that's Revelation 13, verse 3. And verse 4, Revelation 13, 4, the dragon is giving authority to the beast. You know, the Satan is empowering this man, the Antichrist, the beast. And uh, uh, ultimately, uh, this verse 5, Revelation 13, 5, this beast, the Antichrist, is speaking blasphemous things against God. And it says that he continues this for 42 months. So once again, we are saying Revelation 13 starts in the middle of the tribulation and goes on till the end. Why? Because it says in Revelation 13, 5, he does this for 42 months. So what I want us to understand is chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13 are talking about events that take place in the middle of the tribulation and continue on for 42 months, which is three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. So this beast who emerges, who, who came in Revelation 6.1 as the man riding on the white horse. And when you study Daniel, you, you, you will see that he came as a man of peace. Uh, he set up a peace treaty 
and so on. In the middle of the tribulation, this man on the white horse becomes the beast, meaning the Antichrist. He is now speaking blasphemous things against God. So he's changed, you know, his uh, his uh, stance. He's changed his whole position, and he makes war with the saints, with everybody who worships Jesus, Jew or Gentile. And that's um, you know, and uh, it it tells us that uh, he uh, basically, you know, goes out to kill these people. He's against the saints. And then Revelation 13, 11 says, there is another beast. So there's one beast, the Antichrist, empowered by the dragon. But there is another beast. And we see this other beast later on. He is referred to as the false prophet in Revelation 16, 13. He's called false prophet. So in Revelation 13, 11, he's introduced as another beast. In Revelation 16, 13, he's called false prophet. So we will refer to him as false prophet. So the beast is the Antichrist. Another beast is the false prophet. And these two people, men, are empowered by the dragon, that is Satan. So the dragon represents Satan. The beast represents the Antichrist. The other beast represents the false prophet. And what's the job of the false prophet? If you read Revelation 13, 11 on, his job is to get people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. Uh, he comes like a lamb. He speaks like a dragon. And so he, he, uh, his appearance is, you know, like a lamb. Who is the real lamb? Jesus Christ. So he has a false prophet. He pretends to be a religious leader or he comes in the form of a religious leader. He deceives the people. He performs. So, you know, what does he do? Here, verse, Revelation 13, 12. He gets people to worship the first beast. That is the Antichrist. Verse 13. He performs great signs. So he's doing great signs. Verse 14, he deceives people on the earth. So he's he's this religious, that's why we say he's a religious leader. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he's called a false prophet. He comes like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. He gets people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. He performs signs and wonders and he deceives people that he must be a very great teacher who can convince people uh, of his, you know, what he wants them to believe in. in. And he sets up an image of the beast. And this is verse 15, Revelation 13, 15, an image of the beast. And he gets people to worship. And if people don't worship this image, they're killed. So, you know, in, in, in what form? In, and this image could speak, it says. You know, um, in what form would this happen? Uh, you know, if we can think, uh, we don't have to necessarily think of a physical statue or an image, uh, but we could think of, you know, any digital form by which, you know, people are made to worship um, uh, an image of the beast. Uh, about a month or so ago, uh, I saw this news item on BBC where they have created robots, speaking robots that uh, can, you know, take the place of these statues. Uh, yeah, something like that, you know. Um, uh, where, uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, in some places, they're experimenting this. So instead of having the statue of a saint, you have a robot that looks like the saint. And people go to worship the robot, and the robot speaks to them, you know. And, and this is being experimented in some places. And of course, they're using, you know, all of the technology we have available today. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, so I'm just imagining, I mean, the, the, given the technology today, um, Revelation 13, 15 can happen in so many different ways, right? It says this image can speak. 
and if anybody doesn't worship the image they will be killed so you can imagine this image can <laughs> yeah how it can it can also harm and do destruction anyway so given technology it can happen in so many different ways you know we just leave it open and uh, and uh, in addition to the image of the beast another thing that is introduced is the mark of the beast right so basically it's a number or it's a mark and uh, the scriptures just tell us here uh, revelation 13 16 uh, 18 that that if you calculate the number so that means there is some sort of a mathematical intelligence behind it you calculate the number it comes up as 666 okay now whether the number is a literal 666 or whether it's some other you know uh, form um, th there's a there's a clue given that some sort of a mathematics applied to it you calculate it it'll arrive at 666 that's the clue now i remember you know when barcodes came out people used to <laughs> compute the barcodes and any barcode that came out to 666 or something like that you know it would be an alert or so I, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, uh, but just that it is a mark of the beast. And anybody receiving this mark or accepting this mark is basically subscribing to uh, coming under the beast. That is the Antichrist. They're saying, yeah, accept, you know, this, uh, uh, the Antichrist. And the, the interesting thing is that this is tied in to commerce, to commercial transactions. That means you cannot buy or sell unless you take up this mark of the beast. So there are two things. There's the image of the beast that must be worshipped. And there's a mark of the beast that everybody is forced to receive. If you don't worship the image, you'll be killed. If you don't receive the mark, you can't buy or sell. You can't transact commercially. And so these, uh, and both these things are possible in today's world, right? We're talking about something global. Now, so there is, this is why you will hear the terms a world religion or a global religious system and a global economic system or a global financial system, right? Why? Because one, this false prophet has set up this image of the beast, getting everybody to worship it. So that's a religious system. And there's also the mark of the beast, which people must receive in order to buy or sell. That's, so that's the economic system. So both these, a religious system and an economic system that affects globally is very possible today. Very possible. And uh, anybody who refuses to worship the image of the beast or receive the mark of the beast are killed. Right? So if they refuse this, it's death. No other choice. Right? Uh, so um, if they refuse the mark of the beast or if they refuse, you know, they can't buy or sell and basically they're going to be killed. Right. So this, this whole uh, system comes into place. And, 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 and given, and, and I know I'm repeating myself, but what I want to point out is that in today's world, something like you know, this is very possible. It's very possible to implement something like this. It's, you know, there, there's so many options. We don't have to worry about you know, try to figure out which options you're going to use. Is he going to use implants? Is he going to use chips? Is he going to use credit cards? Or what's he going to use? You know, but the fact is something like this can be easily implemented in today's world. You know, how, whatever that form, uh, whatever that technology, whatever is used, you know, we, we don't know. So, all right. So that brings us to the end of chapter 13. I will just uh, pause and, uh, take up some questions. Um, um, 
okay, Abhishek, is it AI technology? Maybe, you know, could be, um, you know, the thing is, the fact is, to, you know, these things are so possible today. Uh, but what if a person who gets the mark then turns to God? So if somebody gets a mark and then turns to God, um, the if, if that 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 process is not referenced referred to in the scriptures. Um, you know, um, so we can't say for sure. But I I'm making an assumption here. I'm assuming that. If somebody repents, God will forgive, right? I'm assuming because I can't. There's no chapter and verse on this, but I'm assuming. Suppose somebody, you know, unintentionally receives the mark, and then they realize that they've made a mis, they've done something wrong. They got to worship the living God, and they repent and turn to God. The my my thought would be that God will forgive, and you know, uh, they may get killed. Obviously, they may get killed for their faith, but my thought is God will. Forget, but there is no chapter and verse, so that that process is not referenced. But my my thought would be, God will forgive. Um, Christopher says some kind of cryptocurrency possible. You know, uh, however it's implemented, we don't know, but we know that technology is available to implement this. Maggie, your question, please. Thank you, sir. Um, just to follow up. To add on, on uh, the question people were asking about about the mark, uh, in I think it's a number of Deuteronomy. Well, God tells Israel that they must have them the mark of uh, his mark. I think his mark of his is his word on their forehead and on their their right hand. So, if the mark of God is uh, invisible and it is. Can can also the mark of beast be invisible? Be something similar to a replica of 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 God's God's mark. Uh, second question is in in Revelation thirteen we see that the, the can or can we say that the the pattern that's uh, in that's in is in the Revelation thirteen of a beast being worshipped. Can you say that it's similar, or it is a copy of of, of, of uh, Daniel three, where Nebuchadnezzar said that if you don't worship the image of, of Iraqet, you'll be uh, you'll be killed. Can we compare those two? And then mm. the last question, sir, is in uh, chapter uh, twelve, where such Satan is is thrown down. Uh, I'm battling to understand if this event was it before revelation tribulations or was it did it happen while well, that the tribulation was happening in that period of time mm -hmm. thank you sir okay yeah. all right all right so let's start with the last question um so revelation 12 um so in revelation 12 there are two events connected with the dragon or you know two or the third one is with what he does so if you want to say you can say three events one is an event of the past that is revelation 12 um, and verse 4 right it says that this dragon he he drew a third of the stars of heaven so Revelation 12, 4, that means this dragon took one third of the angels with him. So that happened in the past. Because uh, when you begin the, in, in Genesis, Satan is there. When in the past it happened, we don't know, but it happened before Genesis. And Jesus said in Luke 10, verse Verse 18, he said, I beheld Satan fall as a lightning from heaven. So that means Revelation 12, 4, Satan was cast out of heaven sometime in the past, before, even before, you know, uh, the birth of Christ physically. Because he said, I saw Satan fall as a lightning from heaven. 
So that's one event that's referenced in Revelation 12, having to do with the dragon. The second event having to do with the dragon is verse 7, Revelation 12, 7, which says that war broke out in heaven and the dragon and his angels fought. So this is, this event is something that's been debated a lot, exactly attempting to answer your question. Is Revelation 12, 7 and 8, you know, basically 7 to 13, or not 13, but 7 to, yeah, 7 to 13. Is it talking about an event that happened in the past, or is it talking about an event that will happen in the middle of the tribulation? So it's been debated a lot. There are some who say, well, it's talking about something that happened in the past. And there are some who say, well, it's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. My personal position, which I shared with you uh, last week, is Revelation 12, 7 through 13, is talking about something that's going to happen in the future, specifically in the middle of the tribulation. Why do we say that? Because the whole, uh, when you look at what is described, it says Satan and his angels, they make an attempt to get into heaven. Michael and his angels stop him. They throw him back to the earth. And then it says in verse 12, he knows he has a short time. And then it says, he goes and persecutes the woman who gave birth to the man child. And then next verse says, this continues for a time, times and half a time, that is three and a half years. So based on what is stated here, verse 12, he has a short time, 13, he's persecuting the woman, that's Israel. Verse 14, it's he's got just three and a half years left. So based on that, my, my conviction is, Revelation 12, 7 to 13 is talking about what will happen in the future, in the middle of the tribulation. But there are, just to keep in, keep in mind, there are others who, you know, who have a different opinion. They feel like, oh no, this happened in the past. Now uh, his attempt to go into heaven happened in the past and, um, and they separate out the attack uh, on Israel, you know, separately. But um, my, 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 my thought is just, just given the way the narrative goes, it seems very logical to say that that attempt to break into heaven, that's verse 7 on to 12, is in the middle of the tribulation. Okay. Um, okay, now I have to remember your first and second question. Um, all right. Can you, what was your first question? Um, okay. uh, first question was, because the Sorry, I forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it also. Um, oh, sorry. The, the mark, mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. so in, uh, oh, is it is visible? Oh, okay, okay. I got it now. So you had two questions on the mark of the beast. One is you referenced uh, what God told his people in the Old Testament. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, uh, and you read about it uh, even in Deuteronomy 6, God told his people to bind his word on their foreheads and on their hands, right? And even put it up as signposts inside their house. So basically how they practiced, how the Jews practiced this was, they would write portions of scripture on small pieces of uh, paper or papyrus, put it in small boxes, you know, uh, or phylacteries, and tie them on their foreheads or on their hands. So actually it was a very visible thing a scripture contained in boxes and you know they practiced it literally like that uh, well god's real intent was for the word to be in their heart right but he told them you know keep them in your in front of your eyes and you know uh, bind them upon a signpost in your house and on your you know in front of your eyes and on your hands so they literally practiced it just to remind them that you're supposed to be living by the word of god so it was a very visible sign uh, so, uh, going by what we see in Revelation 13, uh, uh, this mark of the beast, um, uh, how it is implemented, 
meaning whether it's an implant, whether it's a, you know, a mark on your skin that's not visible, uh, whether it's, you know, some some other form of, you know, uh, uh, marking a person, uh, we don't know. But it is something that will definitely be recognizable. Meaning, recognizable means not, I'm not saying visibly recognizable, but it's something that you like an ID. You have to show, you have to use it uh, in order to transact, in order to buy and sell. So, uh, to answer your question, will it be a visible mark that you know if I see somebody, oh, I see six 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 on him, oh, he's got a six six six. I most likely don't think so. Like, you no, know, people are, don't look at me and say. No, I have a certain ID, uh, ID card. You know, it's not. I carry it with me, but they don't know unless I show it to them. Uh, so whether this mark, which is, which would be put upon the individual, whether that mark is a visible mark that we can see it on each other, my guess. I mean, we we don't know from scripture, but my guess is it's not, not it would not be so, but it definitely be something that systems can recognize. You know, so you could probably walk into a store, and the store will know that. You have the smart, um, you know, today through this through scanning and infrared and other technologies. You know, you can just walk in. You don't have to swipe your card, or you can just walk, and they will know uh, who you are. Uh, you know, and China is China is using like face recognition. That means, hey, we don't just you you being you is enough for us. <laughs> so you walk down the streets, and they have ca cameras everywhere. They're collecting your faces, your face. Uh, thing and they use facial recognition technology and that's it they just know where every citizen is you know in the country almost so they just use face recognition technology so you don't even need to show an id card or anything they just know where you are just by facial face recognition so i'm just saying that uh, they, the technology is so advanced today you don't have to physically carry a card they can just know that you have the mark or you don't have the mark and therefore you can transact so those were your two questions, I think, Maggie. Was there another one? Yes, sir. I had another one, but it's just uh, regarding uh, Revelation 13, uh, 11 downward and Daniel 3. So we're... we're oh, yeah. Oh, oh, the, yeah. So you, we, can, we can compare. We can compare it, except that Daniel 3 was very localized. It was just right there in Babylon. Whereas Revelation 13, 11 will be global. It'll be a global religious system. So that, that would be the huge difference. But here in Revelation 13, you're made to worship the Antichrist. There they were made to worship uh, a golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But you can't compare it, but the scale is hugely different. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's Revelation 13, the, the whole, you know, what, what uh, the Antichrist is going to do. So what we know is there's going to be a global religious system. The goal is to get everybody to worship the Antichrist. There's going to be a global economic or financial system. The goal is to submit to the Antichrist. And he's using that economic system as a means to force people to submit to him. And you got to receive the mark of the beast. Okay. Revelation 14 is an interesting chapter. Okay, we'll just get started on that. Uh, so, so this is all happening, right? So 11, 12, 13 are starting in the middle of the tribulation, going on for 42 months, three and a half years. So somewhere after the middle of the tribulation, and we don't know exactly when, we see these 144,000 Jews standing in the presence of God. They are in heaven. They are in Mount Zion, the heavenly Mount Zion. And they are worshiping before the throne. And they are singing, uh, you know, it says Revelation 42, and they are singing um, a song, they're playing with a harp, and they're singing a song which nobody knows. And it says that they were redeemed from the earth, Revelation 14.3. So they were redeemed from the earth. That means they've taken out of the earth. And it also says in 14 verse 4, they were redeemed from men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb, being first fruits. So the word first fruits 
uh, is uh, either uh, used to talk about being born again, as in James 1, uh, 20, 1 18, or it's also talking about resurrection, physical resurrection, as in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, first fruits. So, how were the 144,000 Jews redeemed from the earth and taken into the presence of God? Revelation 14 doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us were they raptured directly, taken into heaven? Were they killed, then resurrected and taken into heaven? We don't know. I mean, we don't know for sure. What we know for sure is somewhere after the middle of the tribulation, the 144,000 Jews are taken out of the earth and they're taken into heaven. So it is anybody's guess, you know, were they raptured just directly or were they killed, martyred, and then taken into heaven? If the emphasis is on the first fruits, um, the, the, the way the word first fruits is used, it's used in the context of resurrection. So therefore, people would say, well, they were killed and they were resurrected. But some would say, well, they were raptured. Um, yeah. So we just have to leave it open. You know, it, either way, it's fine. But God takes them to heaven, and they're redeemed from the earth. So that's interesting, Revelation 14. The other thing interesting about Revelation 14 is in Revelation 14, there are five angelic announcements. So, will the gospel be preached during the tribulation? One. There are 144,000 Jews who are specially assigned to do it. To many people who uh, realize what is happening will turn to Jesus Christ and they will be bearing witness for Jesus and they will die. Um, they'll be killed for their testimony. We've seen that in Revelation 6 and 12 and so on. Three, everything we are creating today and which we will leave behind, you know, all the content, the videos, the books, websites, all of that content will be bearing witness during the tribulation. And fourth, Revelation 14, there will be angels making announcements to the people. So if you very look quickly, very, very quickly, what these angels are announcing, Revelation 14, 6 says, there's an angel announcing the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And he's telling, the angel is announcing, fear God, give him the glory, because the hour of judgment has come, worship him. So there's an angel announcing this. Now, again, uh, when you read certain commentaries or certain yeah, commentaries on, on Revelation. There are some who would say, and I'm just sharing this because just to give you an idea of different views, uh, uh, some would say, well, this angel is actually a satellite that's you know going around the world that's proclaiming the gospel. Now, these days we have many, many satellites uh, that are being used to proclaim the gospel, uh, not just one. Uh, so, is it right to make an assumption that Revelation 14.6 4, is, um, you know, it's talking about an angel flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming the everlasting gospel. I mean, it's a very nice picture of a satellite. I mean, it's going around, around the earth and uh, proclaiming the gospel to uh, people of all nations, tongues, and so on. I mean, it's a very nice picture. Uh, but is it right to say it's a satellite? Um, my, my, Part is let's just leave it as an angel, right? Uh, simply because uh, it says here there's an angel, and if you make the first angel in satellite, then you have to make the other four angels also satellites, and then it doesn't make sense. 
Okay, so, but there are people who will say, you know, Revelation 14, 6 is, is a satellite going around the world proclaiming the gospel, which is, is very practical, yeah. But there's a problem with that interpretation or that kind of view, because if you have to be consistent in interpretation, then the remaining four angels have to be satellites, which when you read, you, you'll see it doesn't make sense. So just leave it as an angel. God, during the tribulation, sends an angel to be a messenger, just proclaiming to people, hey, believe the gospel, worship God. And this is proclaimed to all the people, nations, tongues, and tribes. Second, there's another angel. This is verse 8, Revelation 14, 8, that is announcing Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. Now, what is Babylon? We will see in chapter 17 and 18 that Babylon refers to the two things Antichrist has introduced with the help of the false prophet. It refers to this false religion, Revelation 17. And then it also refers to this economic system, Revelation 18. You will see it. So both these are referred to as Babylon. One is a spiritual Babylon, one is an economic Babylon or a financial. But here the angel, the second angel in Revelation 14 is announcing Babylon is going to collapse. Babylon is. It's, 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 it's announcing ahead of time. Babylon is going to collapse and all the nations are going to suffer from it. Why? Because it was a global religious system. People all over the world subscribe to the, you know, began to worship the image of the beast. It is a global economic system. People all over the world began to take the mark of the beast. And both these things collapsed. We will see what causes the collapse, and that's that's coming up, Revelation 17 and 18. You know, and uh, in the news that you read today, you see how, and and and, and you know, we are we are all very aware of the war that's happening in Ukraine. But you see how some sanctions were that were made by certain by, by the West overnight caused the collapse, I mean, almost, the collapse of the economics within a country, within Russia. Just within, within one or two days, people are feeling it. And, and uh, it just, 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 just a, an example that, look, this, this thing is real that minor changes can cause in a in a in revelation 18 it says in one hour in one hour the global economic system will collapse revelation 18 when we read it when we get there we will read it in one hour it's gone they had great wealth and it's gone you know and i was reading the news in bbc news you know some of these rich men in russia in the matter of in matter of you know Two days, I guess, since the sanction, economic sanctions were imposed, they have lost millions and billions. Just gone, just vaporized. Revelation 18 talks about in one hour, things just disappear. All the wealth disappears. So today we are in a time when we say like, wow, these things can actually happen. And Babylon is fallen. That's going to be global. What we are seeing, witnessing, uh, we have seen in the past, you know, global impact, collapse of economics, economic systems, financial markets. Uh, we have seen to some extent. But Revelation 18, when Babylon falls, it's going to be huge. So that's the second angel announcing. There's a third angel. This third angel is warning people. Says, if you receive the mark of the beast, if you worship the beast and receive his mark, then you will drink of the wrath 
of the judgment of God. So don't receive. So don't receive. This third angel is warning people. Don't worship the image of the beast and don't receive the mark of the beast. Because if you do, you're going to come under the judgment of God. Then uh, uh, there is a voice in heaven saying, Blessed are verses verse 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. In other words, you know, it's better for you to die in the Lord rather than to receive, to worship the beast or to receive, receive his mark. Right? Then the fourth angel is announcing uh, that there's going to be a great harvest of souls. And you know, so he's saying, God, put in the sickle and reap the harvest, uh, announcing that there's going to be a great harvest of souls. So that is going to happen. The people will be saved because you know the gospel is being proclaimed. People are being warned that the Babylonian system is going to fall. People are warned not to worship the image of the beast or receive the mark of the beast. The fourth angel is announcing there's going to be a great harvest. God put in the sickle. The earth is going to be reaped. Souls are going to be saved. And last one, fifth angel. This is verse 17, Revelation 14. I'll just finish it and then we'll go for the break. This angel announces that there is going to be a great judgment. So uh, the image that is used by the fourth angel is harvest. But the fifth angel is wine press. Wine press is a place where grapes are crushed. That is always symbolic of judgment. Harvest it's like a, 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 the harvest is reaped that is symbolic of souls being saved. We know that, right? Jesus said, look, look on the fields. They are white already for harvest. So that's what the fourth angel is announcing, harvest. The fifth angel is announcing wine press, crushing the grapes is judgment. And then the fifth angel says that the great wine press of the wrath of God, when this is crushed, if we look at Revelation 14, 20, it says blood blood will flow up to the horse's bridle that's about you know five feet or five six feet off the ground not six feet maybe four four to five feet off the ground the horse's bridle blood will flow about six you know, no, four to five feet off the ground for 1600 furlongs for about 184 miles outside the city of jerusalem so that means he's saying this is what's going to happen. There's going to be so much bloodshed outside Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. Blood is going to flow, says here, Revelation 14, 20, up to the horse's bridle, so it's about four or five feet off the ground, for 184 miles. This is basically announcing the Battle of Armageddon that's, that's coming up. So Revelation 15, so Revelation 14, 144,000 Jews are caught up into heaven and there are four angels, or five angels, making announcements. Okay, so let's go for our break uh, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. We'll continue on uh, with chapter 15. Everybody's with me so far? Yeah, you have a question? Okay, let's take a break and we'll be back, right? Thank you.